books in the Bible that are being ignored by preachers because maybe because of many reasons it's hard to preach or it's hard to study. But all these 66 books are involved or included in the gospel of the Bible. So uh, when, I, when I'm thinking about the gospel, uh, mainly we come to when the New Testament starts with the four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So uh, I've heard preachers say, Old Testament is mm, it's for Israel. We just need the New Testament. But if we read the Bible, unless we study the Old Testament, we cannot really understand the, what the New Testament is about. Because the fulfillment of Old Testament is what is being found in the New Testament. So all 66 books, every single verse in the Bible, every single word in the Bible is very important to understand the meaning of the gospel. So now let me come into... Uh, this particular word, gospel. So the root Greek word of gospel is evangelion. So evangelion means E-U-N-G-E-L-I-O-N. It is from that term the word evangelism comes, which means good news. So the root, just understand this, the root word, Greek word of gospel is evangelion, and evangelion means good news. So what is the news and why is it good? Malayadil suvisheshap. Su Visheshap, Su Varta, Nakamalabare. A P Vishesh Vendunda, Nalada. Why is it good? What is the news we have to understand? And then we have to understand why is it good. So the 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 shortcut we all use to uh, describe the gospel is as we know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is very true. That is the whole gist of it. Jesus Christ coming into this world since he loved us. He gave his life and then we believe in him and shall not perish. But when we come to the Gospels, all four Gospels, if you look, the Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and the, the Gospel of John, when Jesus Christ was teaching his disciples about the word Gospel, it was very much connected to their present culture. So, uh, every verse that we learn, every verse has a, a historical context, a context that is related to the particular audience in that book or in that passage. And then it has a present, con a present application that relates to us. So what does the text... So every... Uh, before I go into that, every verse when we learn, we should, we should think about three questions. What does the verse mean to them? What is the historical context of that verse? What is, so we, we can understand the context by reading the verses before and after, usually. Or sometimes we'll have to read the entire chapter. Or sometimes we'll have to read the entire book to understand a verse. And then how do you bridge the context to our, or our situation or to us? And what does it mean to us? So we, these are the questions we have to ask whenever we study a verse or a, or, or a passage or even a book. So these questions should be in our mind when we, whenever we study a verse or whenever we study a pass, passage, and that's how we really understand the full picture of a verse or full picture of the Bible. I just just told it when uh, now. So when Christ Jesus and uh, dis, uh, taught his disciples about the word gospel, it is very much, as I said, connected to their culture of Israel. So in though in that context, in context of Israel, the word evangelion or good news was an extreme political term. So we know the Israel was, uh, re, I mean, ru uh, King Caesar ruled Israel. It was ruled by the Roman Empire. So all Israel was, all, is, all the Jews, what were, they were thinking is, how we can get delivered from this Roman Empire? How can we get saved from this Roman Empire? That's all their thinking was. That's all what they thought. So whenever Jesus taught something, that's what they were thinking. Okay, King C uh, how will we get free from the rule of Caesar? the high taxes that we paid to King Caesar. These are the things that were reigning in their mind. But when Jesus taught, or when Jesus uh, was teaching about the gospel, he was, taught, he was teaching gospel in, this, in, in, in its entirety, in its full context. So the word evangelion, in the biblical context, if we learn the word gospel, the gospel is about the royal announcement. Jesus Christ was talking about the kingdom of God. The arrival of the kingdom of God through Jesus. That's all he was concerned about. 
the kingdom of god arriving through the life death and resurrection of jesus christ that's the entirety of the gospel so they were ruled by the world, earthly kingdom and that's why jesus says my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom is of heaven and even in the lord's prayer we pray right thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven so the arrival of kingdom or the arrival of god's kingdom on earth is what jesus was concerned about so what is this kingdom of god what was the necessity of the kingdom of god coming to this earth what was the necessity or what is the significance of the teaching of jesus that is what i'm going to talk about today the entire bible the 66 books i'm going to shorten it to 30 minutes and <laughs> it, every single theme of the bible it takes hours days and years to learn but i'm just trying to shorten it to 30 minutes the whole cover to cover bible <laughs> So next slide the core four themes of the bible many of us know uh, we have studied studied in sunday school so these four themes of the bible when you study bible cover to cover from the beginning and the, to the end these are the four main things the entire gospel story of the bible can be classified in this four or the, and these are the four main themes creation fall redemption and new creation or restoration the bible starts with the verse in the beginning right in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and god created people in his own image god saw all that he made and it was very good so this is the whole gist of genesis 1 and 2 the creation story the theme of creation that we see in genesis 1 and 2 god the creator made everything good because since his character is good whatever he makes whatever he does whatever he says whatever he fulfills everything will be good because then only it will match the character of god we, we when we read the psalms we read the verse we have we have many verses in the psalms that god is good and his mercy endureth forever avane dey nekumulo devam nallaven allo malayalathil i like that malayalam nallaven allo because it's confirming devam nallaven aanu God is good they were nallaven allo avante deya nekumulla his mercy endureth forever so let me uh, go fast god created the heavens and the earth and we know traversing through the uh, following verses god created adam and eve in the garden of eden and entrusted with them the responsibility to take care of everything in the garden adamine hawayam devam elpichu thotathinte responsibility he created adam and eve he gave the responsibility to adam and eve and entrusted them to take care of everything in the garden so god created them to live in harmony to have fellowship with god to worship him but there was a twist in the story as we all know the gospel story had a fantabulous start had a fabulous start everything was created for good everything was created for his glory everything was created so that man or human beings will live in harmony will worship god will have that that fellowship with each other and fellowship with god but as we know the twist came in the form of fall and that is the second theme disobedience was the first diversion of the gospel so god created everything good everything was going good till the point where man decided to sin to disobey god So disobedience was the first diversion of the gospel sto- story and it not only became the diversion but it was a decisive moment in the whole gospel story in the whole scriptural story God created and then when the fall happened it turned everything upside down it didn't turn the plans of God upside down because God had planned everything good and till the end of the world or everything is planned beforehand by God and God knew about it and God permitted the fall but from a human perspective when we think it turned upside down it turned the entire plan the good plans of god upside down god gave adam the freedom to eat anything but he also asked one thing to refrain to avoid eating out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and he also uh, made adam aware of the consequence if you eat this what is going to happen he also made him aware but still they disobeyed god the uh, satan tempted them and then they disobeyed god and they sin so the story moves on they keeps on going and uh, we know adam and eve were created and when they sinned when they 
uh, decided to divert the gospel story, what happened is that they lost the glory and honor they had. So we know Eastern culture is more about honor and glory, right? So in that culture, in the Eastern culture, God created them gloriously with honor. But when they lost the honor, they became shameful. So they lost all the glory and honor they had. The rebellious choice of man detached man from God. And the perfect image of man got blurred by God, um, got blurred by the sin. So by the sinful action, by the sinful decision they took, the perfect image which they were created by God got blurred. And what happened? A barrier got created between God and man. Initially, God was in, or man was in harmony with God. Man was worshiping God. But then the time they sinned, they decided to sin, a barrier got created between man and God. Man got separated from God. That's why Paul says we were alienated from God. We were alienated from the presence of God, which resulted in eternal death of man. So the sin resulted in eternal death of man. But the gospel story didn't end there. God had better plans. If we read on the Old Testament, though man fell, we know in Genesis 3.15, the verse where God gave a ray of hope. So he gave a hint of future while talking to the serpent. In Genesis 15, we read uh, about a person, about a person who would crush the head of the serpent and strike his heel. So God already gave a promise in Genesis chapter 3 that this is not the end of the story. The story is going to continue, but there's a twist that's going to happen in the future. It doesn't end with this twist. Twists are going to come. And he gave that ray of future. He gave that ray, gave that ray of hope in Genesis 3.15. So we know I'm going to traverse fast. The story continues. We have Abraham. We have Noah. God promising Abraham about the blessing that is going to come to the nations through Abraham. And there are many subplots in the gospel story uh, when we read the Old Testament. We know the famous... Uh, the, the famous travel from Egypt to the land of Canaan. God chose Mo, Moses to lead the people from Egypt to Canaan. And we know what all happened in that, in that journey. The journey that was supposed to be very short became 40 years. And still Israel didn't learn a lesson. The, even though they enjoyed the blessings of God, even though they enjoyed every, every good thing from God, every favor from God, they still didn't learn the lesson. They continued to sin. They continued to be in idolatry. They continued to be in pagan worship. They continued to persist in sin. And then the story goes, uh, for they, uh, finally they reach Canaan. And we know what happened. Canaan, even though it's promised and that we learned it's a land of milk and honey, but there were still wars in Canaan. Other foreigner kings came to conquer Israel. And then finally, Israel once was sent to captivity. Because of their idolatry, because of their continued disobedience to God, God decided to put them in captivity. We know the story. When we go, come to the minor prophet book, prophetical books, the whole, uh, the, um, Israel's people, Israel's, the people of Israel had to go into exile, right? And then the gospel story didn't end there. God had better plans for them. God promised them that you're going to have a better future. You're going to have a better hope. So though they were in exile, that didn't end the story of Israel. They were delivered from Israel through Cyrus. So even though Nebuchadnezzar uh, made them to go through captivity in Babylon, through Cyrus, God uh, worked, his plans worked, and finally they came back to Jerusalem. But still, there was one single problem that didn't end. Even through, so if we look at all the 39 books of Old Testament, we see king's rule, the judge's rule, people go into captivity. Through, uh, through, if we read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, these, these are all very major prophetical books that we have to learn verse by verse. We all see that God pronounce, I mean, God uh, announcing judgment if, we, if they don't turn away from the ways of the wicked, if they don't turn away from the ways of sin. But if they do, if they turn away from their wicked sin, God uh, promised blessing upon them. And we come to the minor prophetical books towards the end of Old Testament. We see the pre-exile, the life of Israel before exile and life of Israel after exile. They came back, but still sin didn't end. Sin was 
<clears throat> they still keep, kept on sinning. And that's where the, the, the greatest person that has ever lived on the earth decide to arrive. God already had planned the arrival of Christ ages before the foundations of the world. But that plan or that, that plan of God came active or came into existence once God decided to send Jesus Christ into the world. And that's what we, we, read, we start reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus Christ was born. And that's where our third theme starts, redemption. The plan of redemption starts when Jesus Christ arrives in this world. He was born in this world. So God the Father sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to fulfill all the promises made to Israel. So if we read Old Testament, every single promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In, when, we, uh, con when we are concerned about the life of Israel, when we are concerned with Israel, every single promise that God gave to them finally was fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. The law was completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So that's why we read in uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, we read, Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Word was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. So if you read, can someone read Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15? Gospel of Mark chapter 14 and 15. Yes, that's where Jesus preaches the gospel. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The whole gist of the gospel message preached by Jesus Christ is found here in the gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 15. So they were going through a, uh, through a time where Caesar, the Roman Empire ruled Israel, right? In that context, in that uh, uh, in, that, in that time, Christ is preaching to the disciples. Christ is pre preaching to the people. The time is fulfilled. Okay, the time which God had mentioned in the Old Testament has fulfilled. And now is the time. The kingdom of God is at hand. And it has come to the earth through me. Christ is announcing that. The royal declaration made by God has now arrived through me. And he says, or he expects a response from the people. And that's why he asked them to repent and believe in the gospel. So, what does repentance mean? We, don't, we know the term repentance, uh, again, the Greek word of repentance is metanoia. Metanoia means turn back, or it's a 180 degree turn. You go straight, you go in a way, and then if repentance happens, you turn back. So you turn back from your wicked ways. You were living in sin. You are dead in your trespasses. You are dead in sin. And then you take a U-turn when you believe in the gospel. When you repent, then you cannot go in the wicked ways which you were living. You cannot walk in the wicked ways which you were walking. You have to take a right. You have to take a U-turn and come back to God. We were alienated from the presence of God. We were separated from the presence of God. But when the Spirit regenerated our hearts, when we believed in the gospel by faith, we took a U-turn and then we turned back to God and called God Abba Father. That is the privilege that we all have got through the gospel to call him Abba Father, to, uh, to be back in harmony with God. The, the relationship was strained, right? The relationship, we had a barrier between the, our relationship with God. But through Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ came, that barrier got moved. That barrier was removed. And now we have access to God the Father. We were reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. So Galatians 3.13, if you read, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus Christ lived on this earth. He died on the cross of Calvary. And he became a curse for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, He who knew no sin 
became sin for us. For what? So that we would become the righteousness of God. He who knew, very carefully, we will study the verses. He who knew no sin, Christu spavate aranye thilla. He who knew no sin, knew no ke. Utri Greekly study karna thena utri deeper meaning. And I don't want to go into all that. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Our sins were credited on to Jesus Christ, and what we got. the imputed righteousness of jesus christ christuvinte neethi nammale dharipichu he dressed us his righteousness and took our sins uh, i'm coming into that um, the part of justification later but so what i was trying to say is he became sin for us at the cross of calvary and he gave us his righteousness the gospel story didn't end there there was a glorious appearance that is yet to come he was resurrected Jesus Christ died at the cross he was buried in the tomb and then on the third day he was resurrected it didn't end there he appeared to the disciples he appeared to Mary and then he was ascended to the heavens so he lived on this earth he died at the cross he was buried in the tomb he was resurrected and then he ascended to heavens according to God's plan the gospel story still did in and there now he is interceding for us as a faithful advocate he is interceding for each one of us as a faithful advocate on at the right hand of god and then the gospel story has a future the new creation christ is going to come back and we are going to be glorified we are he is going to take us up all those who are in christ are going to be taken up and we are going to rule the earth forever we are going to be with god forever so revelation 1916 says on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written the king of kings and the lord of lords what a powerful statement made by apostle john through i mean the spirit by the spirit through apostle john on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written king of kings and the lord of lords so christ is going to come back in full glory in the future in the near future we don't know when what 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 time is he is going to come but he is going to come as he has he promised to us as he's promised in the scripture so during this time what is our responsibility he has sent his holy spirit to empower us to equip us to teach us to counsel us to comfort us so this is what the spirit is doing right now through our lives the holy spirit is empowering us equipping us teaching us counseling us comforting us and right now we are participants of the kingdom of god by putting our faith in the god by putting our faith in the lord by putting our faith in god we have now become participants in the kingdom of god so i just gave a very short picture of creation fall redemption and new creation right the scripture portrays a very sparkling picture about our future about the future of the participants of the kingdom ee devarajyathin angangala nammal oru oru thirum we are all part of this kingdom right now so what is our future every person in his kingdom every person who is a participant of his kingdom will be restored completely we won't be having any sin in our body we won't be having sorrows we won't be having any shame no sickness nothing when we are going to be glorified till then we all have to go through this we all have to go through temptations we all have to go through trials tribulations persecutions suffering sickness everything we all have to go through but when christ is going to come again when christ is going to come back and glorify us we will be perfectly glorified we will be perfectly restored into the first into the nature of the first human human god created god created everything good right but we lost the honor and glory and we inherited adam's sin we were born in sin as we see read in scripture paapathil namma enna garbham therichu paapathil njan uruvai we were born in sin but our future is the promise that god has given us we are going to be restored into that new creation and in ephesians 3:6 says we we learned about the the mysteries of the gospel the mysteries that are being mentioned in the scripture so i want to uh, point out one mystery the mystery is that through the gospel the gentiles are heirs together with israel members together of one body and sharers together 
in the promise in Christ Jesus. So the kingship of Jesus started with Israel, but it doesn't just include only Israel. It concludes with, if you read Revelation, all nation, every tribe, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Irrespective of the caste, creed, ethnicity, all are equal in the, person, in, in Jesus, in the sight of God. Every tribe, every tongue, the Gentiles and Jews are coerced together with Christ Jesus. So we all share in the body of Christ. We are all members together of this one body. So now what is our role? So I mentioned gospel is the royal declaration of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior and King of all. So we learn mainly about, so as I said before, my main topic is discipleship. I'm coming to that. So we go back to redemption. Jesus Christ redeemed us. He gave us salvation when we repented of our sins and believed in the gospel. He gave us the salvation. So through faith in Christ, we become participants in this kingdom. And uh, the word faith has a very, a very broad meaning. Uh, many a times we use faith as be just trusting in the Lord. But faith doesn't end in trusting. The word pistis in Greek it, it, it means to be loyal, to be allegiant to Jesus Christ. And one side of the coin is faith, and the other side is that that faith is proved through our works. Through our good works, our faith is being proved. So Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The same Bible, we read another verse, Matthew 24, 13. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So the moment we put our trust in the Lord Jesus, the moment we repent of our sins and believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior, we are saved. That's what 24, 13 says, we shall endure unto the end. So that is the responsibility on our part. God saved us through Jesus Christ by grace that we are being saved and not of our works, but from the moment of salvation, but from the moment of our redemption, good works are expected from a responsible believer and we shall endure unto the end and that is not through our might through our works the spirit works inside us god in his will for his good pleasure works inside us and we work out by the help of the spirit unto his glory so before i go to discipleship i want to mention these three phases which we all know but i just want to revise it Salvation has three phases, right? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Nidhi karanam, vishuddhi karanam, tejas karanam. So, being righteous, being holy, and being glorious in the future when Christ appears. So, we know that uh, verse in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 26. The righteousness of God. That's what I mentioned uh, before. Justification is a, it's a, it's a courtroom language where God is the righteous judge. And we are pleading guilty. We are guilty of our sins. But Jesus Christ comes as a savior. Jesus Christ comes into that court in, in, in front of God the judge and take our sins. He says, I will, I will take the penalty for their sins. He comes before God the Father. He takes the penalty of our sins. And then he gives us his righteousness. So if we... Next slide. So if we uh, uh, understand salvation, salvation is a work of the Trinity. That's another theme. We see, if you read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, all the three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are involved in our salvation. So if you read Ephesians, it's very clear. We can read it later. God the Father elects us. We are chosen by God before the foundations of the world. And then God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, that he loved us. That's what we read in John 3.16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus Christ comes to this world. He purchases us through his death. And finally, God the Spirit regenerates us and he sanctifies us. So remember, all the three persons in the Godhead are involved in our salvation. God the Father elects us before the foundations of the world. God the Son loves us and purchases us through his, through his death by giving us giving his life for us and then God the Spirit regenerates us, redeems us and sanctifies us. So 
coming back to justification, the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are declared justified. Before we were not, we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. But the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are declared holy in the sight of God. We are declared justified in the sight of God. So to define justification, justification can be defined as the act of God where he declares a sinner righteous and holy based on his or her faith in Christ Jesus. It is an act of God, a complete act of God where God declares a sinner righteous based on our faith in Jesus Christ alone for his glory alone. And we, we know through the Pauline epistles, we know justification is by faith alone, in Christ alone. Remember, Paul says we were alienated from the presence of God. We were strangers in the sight of God. We lived in darkness. Sin was the darkness. We didn't know the light. But then God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And through Jesus Christ, God showed his light and he made us alive. Paul in their language, language in Ephesians 2. We were dead in our trespasses and God in his mercy, right? He, we were in darkness. We were in sin. We were drowning in sin. And then Paul says, God rich in mercy, in his mercy, he made us alive. We were dead. We were drowning. And then Jesus Christ comes. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take us up from our drowning situation in his mercy. Through his mercy, he, from our drowning situation, he made us alive. We were dead in Jesus Christ. And then Paul uh, describes, by his grace, we are saved. So a very, very, uh, these are all terms that, as I said, very deep meanings for each of the term. I'm just uh, going very fast. So a great example, which Paul even mentioned in Romans, is Romans 4.3, where, where Paul says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So remember, when we put our trust in God, when we put our faith in God, it is credited, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited unto us, as I said before. Christ took our punishment. Christ took our sins, and his righteousness was imputed to us. And Romans 4.25 says, he was raised for our justification. He died, and then he was raised. So the, both the death and resurrection are important. Uh, there are preachers who just give importance to death. There are preachers who give just importance to the resurrection. But every verse, uh, the, uh, or, 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 or every verse in the Bible when we study, we need to balance. Like we cannot, any, anything we go through, okay, this verse is not so the Sharia lay. But there is a, another verse. So every time when we study something, every time we go through a situation, we have to balance the Bible. We have to balance verses. We cannot just make a doctrine out of a single verse. That's not how we study the Bible. That's not how we apply the Bible. We have to balance the scripture. The same way, the salvation in, um, our salvation is based upon the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are equally important when it comes to our salvation. So Romans 4 25 says, Christ was raised of our justification. So as I said, we are justified in the sight of God. We are declared holy. We are positionally sanctified. When we trusted in God, when we believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the moment we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are declared holy. We are declared blameless. We are declared righteous in the sight of God. But again, salvation doesn't end with justification. The next phase is sanctification. So sanctification means being holy. Sanctification means set apart. Sanctify. Sanctify in Artham Varnal, set apart for a particular purpose. Set apart for the higher purpose of God, for a particular purpose of God. He called us and where did he Where did he mean separated from God? So we are separated for a particular purpose of God. We are justified. We are declared holy. We are declared righteous. That's God's declaration. Now it's our responsibility. And in Philippines 2, we know, work out our, our own salvation with fear and trembling. 
for it is god who is working inside you right so that's the balance that's what i said every author of the bible tries to balance their theology their doctrine work out our own salvation that is our responsibility but it's not us alone god is working inside us so god is working for his good pleasure god works inside us and then it is our responsibility to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling so uh um uh, our time is almost going to be up uh, so i will continue uh, the rest of the study in the next class so sanctification i just want to uh, conclude today's class with uh, these two verses first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 it is god's will that you should be sanctified the first part of first thessalonians 4 3 says god's will deva hidamana nammal sanctify aagapadanu nu parayunnathu it is god's will that you should be sanctified and then another balancing verse for that is first corinthians chapter 130 which says it is because of him that you are in christ jesus who has become for us wisdom from god that is our righteousness holiness and redemption so remember christ is our sanctification christ is our holiness christ is our justification christ is our righteousness that is an underlying fact that we all need to keep in our heart you don't know we have responsibility we have to do things we have to we are we are obliged to do good works for god but this is all based on the fact that christ is our justification christ is our righteousness nammade neethi kristu aanu nammade vishuddhi ennu parayunnathu kristu aanu christ is our valare clear aayitta paulus first corinthians 130 il adu parayunnathu christ who has become for us wisdom from god that is our righteousness that is our holiness that is our redemption so the moment we accepted jesus christ into our hearts as savior we are in union with christ we are in you we participate in christ these are all again deep me deeper meanings but understand this we are in union with christ christ has become our righteousness christ has become our redemption christ has become our holiness based on that based on the fact that christ is our holiness based on the fact that christ is our redemption based on the fact that christ is our, christ is our righteousness we work out we work we do good works we bear the fruit of the spirit so all this bearing uh, the fruit of the spirit that we see in galatians is based on the fact that christ is working inside us christ is our foundation christ is our cornerstone and that is the foundational doctrine that we all have to keep in our heart that we all have to learn kristu aan ende neethi kristu aan ende vishuddhi and christ is our redemption so i will describe sanctification and glorification uh, next week next week study so just remember this the gospel story the core four themes of gospel story creation fall redemption and restoration creation happened god was good and god created everything good then the twist came in the form of fall the fall happened it didn't end there god sent his son to redeem us we have now been redeemed and redeemed and we are now living a life worthy of our calling and calling and election looking forward to the day that christ is going to come and that's when we will be completely restored creation fall redemption restoration let us pray